Um, thank you, Andres, and thank you to MoMA and to um, the Architectural League for the invitation. I'm uh, very excited to be here, and most importantly for me, and I've got to add a personal note, it's the first time in 10 years that I've been together with my three children who all live in the United States at the same time. <coughs> so it's been absolutely wonderful. Um, my my, my uh, presentation tonight is really not structured around um, anything other than to really show you a set of projects that I've been involved in and to try and give you a flavor of what the issues are that one deals with in South Africa uh, as an architect. Um, I'd like to start off by simply saying that I've always held, and I imagine it has probably been an unfashionable view for a number of years, the idea that architecture is a social art and it's brought into being in order to satisfy some kind of ethical good, that there is an intrinsic relationship between program and form, and that without program, you can't have form. You can't, you can't have architecture. So um, I declare my position quite clearly that I have been appalled for a number of years by the writings of people like Peter Eisenman and others who talk about the autonomy of form, and I've just wondered where this madness will lead us. I think we've seen it for the last 10, 15 years. Hopefully the recession will flush it out of the system. That is my hope. But then I come from another part of the world where really the issues that we have to deal with are fundamental issues. They are not issues of highbrow, uh, uh, fancy dancing on the ends of pins or whatever it might be. It's simply we've got people that need to be house educated and looked after. How can architecture serve those kinds of needs and how can we do it with the degree of dignity and quality and that what we build hopefully has some kind of spatial uh, dignity attached to it that will have some kind of impact on the way those communities feel and think about themselves. And in South Africa, I've lived and worked in three um, very distinct areas, and I show them on the map uh, on the uh, Johannesburg, which is a wonderful, wonderfully mad, uh, insanely dangerous city, um, a bit out of control but which is becoming a really major city in the world and certainly in Africa. Cape Town, which is a very different city from any other city you'll find in Africa. Most foreigners who come to Cape Town uh, don't believe it's an African city. Uh, part of the reason for that is that um, Cape Town, when it was settled by the Dutch in 1652, which means that Cape Town is as old in colonial terms as New York City, <coughs> When the uh, Dutch settled it, uh, there were no um, uh, black African people living in that part of the country. The only people who lived there were the Khoisan people. The Dutch then imported a huge number of slaves to work on the farms, um, and there were successive waves of German and Dutch uh, French Huguenot settlers. The consequence of that is that Cape Town, Cape, the Cape Province, there is a place uh, of essentially people of mixed race. Um, 70 to 80 percent of the population of the Western Cape are people of mixed race, and most of them are descended from settlers. So it's in a funny way a city that is not dissimilar to New York, in the sense that it's a city of immigrants. Um, and that makes it very different from the rest of South Africa. And then the third city that I'll be showing you um, projects from is Port Elizabeth on the East Coast, which is the Detroit of Africa. It's where most of the automobiles that are sold in Africa are built. Many of them also that are um, assembled and built in Port Elizabeth are imported to the rest of the world. Um, the, the thing that I wanted to really talk, uh, talk about tonight in, in, in my um, uh, uh, talk to you is ideas about how people think about art and how they think about culture. Now, in Southern African black languages, for example, there's no word to describe beautiful, something that is autonomous, the Kantian idea of beauty as being a property without purpose. Everything that is beautiful is functional. In other words, something is only beautiful because it suits a purpose. And this um, uh, drawing that I have up on the board here, which is done by a very well-known South African artist called John Muffin Gedro, captures that idea because it's, it's, it's about African art from my part of uh, Africa, Southern Africa, but it's, Af it's art that tells a story. So it's a story that tells you about, um, it's a historical record of political activities that took place in Namibia 
during the pre-independence struggle, and it's about the role of the church uh, in supporting that struggle and what happened. So it's a historical document, but it's also an artwork. And that has always intrigued me, because I think that if anything characterizes the art of my part of the world, it is that it's always an art that tells a story, and the story is usually very clear. Um, the other issue that I'm interested in is, is uh, African readings of cities, and the way in which, uh, with a wonderful imaginative flair, African people represent the contemporary city in quite extraordinarily rich ways. This is a ballpoint pen from a Zulu um, artist called Tito Zungu, which represents uh, his idea of what a contemporary city would be. And, and I can tell you, I'd like to live in that kind of city much more than most contemporary cities I know in the world. So it's that search to try and find a way of giving, an, uh, giving expression to and an understanding to of what could constitute African space and an African city that moves away from these terrible kind of ideas that I think people have about African architecture, which their beehive huts and everything was circular and form, etc. The other um, uh, thing that has influenced the work that I've done very strongly is that because of the dreadful um, uh, impact that apartheid had on, on everything in our lives, but particularly in culture, um, it, it's very difficult to even begin to start to talk where it might begin. And, 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 and if you take my point that I think really true authentic urban culture starts from the bottom up, then for me the only place you're going to find it in South Africa are in the spontaneous settlements, the shack settlements that sit on the periphery of our cities. So right from the beginning of my career, I studied shack settlements, and I became interested in them, not as social phenomena, but as architectural and spatial phenomena as well. And I've always believed, and I still believe, that it's in those parts of our cities where people are working entirely on their own, where there's no hindrance to what they do because they're working illegally, in other words, outside of the legal framework of the country, that I think you begin to see the possibilities of what uh, another kind of um, uh, city form could be. And so this has largely influenced the way in which um, I've thought about architecture. It certainly informed the early work I did in terms of how buildings were constructed. Um, I'm going to go very quickly through some early projects that we did just to give you an idea of how things started. And the first set of projects really are a series of community-based projects where local people were engaged in construction. And again, our lesson was that people lose heart because these projects usually take so long. And symbolically, which is for me quite interesting, is that in many, many people's minds, a building is complete when the roof is up. So adding those two things together, we de developed a series of systems where what we did is we constructed a steel framework which could be built in a factory, built very precisely, could be brought to site and erected and have a roof on it within a week. And then local people would be engaged in filling in the walls underneath the roof in whatever ways they saw fit, but their enthusiasm would be steadfast right from the beginning of the project and because the roof was up, first and foremost, um, the, 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 the sense of completion was always present. Um, as, uh, this is a, a, a set of uh, little uh, daycare centers that we did. I did this in the early 1980s, which is, makes me feel old, 25 years ago. Um, but what was interesting about this, and I must tell you, is that these buildings uh, we built for a local um, NGO, which was part of the United Democratic Front, and the buildings were painted in the colors of the ANC, which was uh, green for the wealth of the land, gold or yellow for the um, gold under the ground, and black, which was what the concrete of the seal frames are painted for the people. I was arrested by the police for those colors, because um, in those days it was an illegal, it was illegal, it was a criminal act to represent the ANC in any way. And the way in which I got away with it was to explain to a not very bright policeman that this actually wasn't gold, it was yellow. It tells you how crazy apartheid was. Um, uh, other, other projects that we were involved in were to build large numbers of churches. I worked closely with Desmond Tutu when he was Bishop of Johannesburg. And Desmond Tutu had a 19th century idea of the churches, which is that he felt that in the, the townships of uh, South Africa, where there was a single story uniform scale, the role of the church should be not just to build a place of worship, but to build a place that would represent um, a, a kind of, it would become an urban symbol. So 
uh, I got involved in trying to uh, develop a series of churches with him that would not would, would mark important urban spaces in, in, for example, Soweto. It was not dissimilar to what the Anglican Church did in the 19th century London slums when the church employed architects like Hawksmoor and others to build very fine, tall, vertical churches in the slums, which still are there today. I don't think my churches will be because they were built out of very cheap materials. But, uh, for example, uh, attempts to try and um, uh, uh, develop ideas of a centralized church plan because the nature of the um, black South African uh, church uh, service is a didactic one and it's theatrical. Um, and uh, um, uh, buildings that, uh, this, this was in fact the first building I ever did, it's St. Paul's Church in Jabalba, White City, Soweto. Um, and, and, and a series of um, uh, uh, rural churches uh, which used um, agricultural steel sheds and the only thing that was different were the facades that we made. We did about 40 to 45 of these churches right throughout the Transvaal and as part of what I did was that um, we would give the church a little plaque which would represent the front face of the building, the front facade of the building that would be fixed to the inside of the church and uh, one of the interiors. Um, a, a, a little chapel I did for Desmond Tutu in the backyard of his house where the, where the washing line used to be. It's a tiny little space. It's two meters wide by about four meters in length. It was a private meditation chapel for himself. Um, and uh, other, I, I, I'm explaining these things to give you a sort of flavor of what it was like to work in South Africa at the time. This was a very interesting project because it was done in uh, Pelachen Community Center in, in Jabalba, White City. And it was a staging post for returning South Africa, for returning ANC people uh, coming into South Africa at a time when uh, the police were still hunting them. And we took what was essentially a single story building that had been designed by some German architects uh, through the Lutheran Church, um, which was, in my opinion, very wasteful. But we changed it to a three-story building. So it was a single-story building with trusses at that line there. And we built three stories inside of it. But we had to do all of this under cover of night because we couldn't allow the um, township officials to know we were doing it. So everything was done, everything was prefabricated, made off-site, and then brought into Soweto at night time in the back of Bucky's and then assembled under, in the cover of darkness. And we built it without no one knowing what we were doing. Uh, this was what it looked like. The only thing that you could tell that changed the building was, in fact, the roof lights that we put in. But I don't think that the officials who were running Sowet at that time even knew what a roof light was. And then the inside of the space, which was uh, an entirely different kind of space uh, with a very, very different scale. And what this did, and again, this comes out of um, the idea that I have that design is research, research is design, that I think we need design as an architect to construct new knowledge, is that this taught me the value of space as a resource, that every single cubic centimeter of space counts for something. We managed to transform a building that uh, accommodated 33 people into a three-story space that accommodated over 100. Um, a series of community buildings that we did, and I, 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 again, uh, to talk to you about ideas that we would grappling with at that time was how to make buildings transparent, how, how to make buildings that people could understand. And, and one of the things that I became interested in was to how to make buildings that were literally transparent, literally people could understand them. And that meant that spatially on the outside of the building, you would reveal the spatial um, condition of the building inside. And that you would choose materials to do particular jobs that only those materials could do. So the building would become tectonically literate and spatially uh, legible. Um, and this led to a series of community buildings, uh, community resource centers that we did right throughout the Johannesburg uh, Soweto region. Um, and a series of small houses. This is a, a tiny little house that I did for a, a medical doctor um, in Alexandra Township. Uh, and a construction system, which you can see here, starts to learn on the stick system that's employed in the shacks where. A very simple timber framework is set up and then materials are either fixed onto it or fixed inside of it. And then the sort of literal transparency of the building, it's very clear how the building is made, but it's also very clear what the spatial relationship of the building is. 
And then the thing that really made me interested, and this was a great lesson for me, again, this was a building I did in about 25 years ago, the inside space of the building with the roof cracked open to bring light to it. But what was more important for me was that my doctor friend <coughs> fell in love with the minister of, in, in Robert Mugabe's government in Zimbabwe and left South Africa and left the house in the hands of her young cousin, who was a budding entrepreneur. And he transformed that house into a virtual uh, social condenser. He transformed the two bedrooms upstairs into dormitories and rented them out. He transformed the kitchen into a little general store. And where the living room was below, he had a snooker, it's a set of snooker tables. And this tiny 100 square meter, 1,000 square meter house became another building completely. And that, I think, is a very intriguing idea about how buildings adapt to change over time, how people can take them and almost pull, reread re the kind of spaces and find new ways to give them expression. And I think this has certainly influenced a lot of the work that we've done subsequently. Um, I show these buildings because it became quite interesting. Um, with uh, um, the changes in government in South Africa in the early 1990s, suddenly people woke up to the fact that certainly in the so-called white areas, that there were a bunch of people who lived in the townships and that they lived very different lives. And because of the work we've been doing, we suddenly became fashionable in the wealthy sectors of our cities. And we were able to take ideas we developed in the townships and build those areas in the rich parts of the city. And that became quite an intrigue as well. So this is a set of um, office buildings that we did um, which were entirely um, self-sufficient. Johannesburg had a hot, dry climate and we could use evaporative cooling for the buildings, but we developed a system of uh, adjustable louvers. This was done in 1991, of adjustable louvers covered with shade cloth that could be individually adjusted by um, the um, uh, office worker. And uh, the building over here where you can see the, the kind of, I think, quite fine-brained uh, uh, opportunity we gave for individual adjustment of uh, each independent office. And then a series of um, office buildings, a series of city buildings, um, trying to construct buildings in the city centre where we created a new residential ground plane. These are courtyard buildings. This is the city space which we gave over to public facilities, which was shopping, parking, uh, 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 open public space, and then created a new city space above that, which is a green space that is surrounded by um, uh, housing. Um, which is absolutely secure. Um, and uh, these became quite, unfortunately we couldn't build these buildings, but um, what, what we did is, for example, the points of entry into the courtyard spaces, we located pensioners' housing, so you had old people who weren't working, who were the eyes on the community, and worked through a whole series of ideas like that. Um, issues that I developed when I was working with a man called Tim Frankie, who had been at the, the GSD, a fantastic landscape architect who now lives in Texas, of um, uh, the idea of a productive landscape, which I'll show you some ideas of later. And then a series of housing projects that we did where really what we try to do is deal with that idea of the impact of time on built form, really try to speculate about how, how badly people could really mess up this thing that we were doing, and would it still retain an identity, a sense of its own self. Project we're doing, this is now from my time in Cape Town. Um, this is a, a, an inner city project um, in Cape Town. It hasn't been built, but we're hoping to get uh, funding for it. But it builds up on the idea of a productive landscape, but not more than productive landscape, urban agriculture, where a very, very high density of housing, we identified three kinds of um, uh, space for uh, uh, urban agriculture, the um, garden and the house, the allotment, which could be cooperative housing, and then finally large, large, maybe one acre to two acre pieces of ground where commercial farming could occur. And we found a way of being able to bring these three things together in a single housing community. And uh, certainly the projections that we made is that uh, of the families who lived here, probably 40% of them would be able to generate sufficient income through this urban agriculture to be sustainable. In other words, they wouldn't have to leave the site to find work. They could work on site and they would make enough money through these opportunities that were created um, to, to be able to support themselves and their families. Which I think is, uh, you know, one of the most extraordinary statistics I've heard recently is that Beijing, which is a city of, I think, 16 or 18 million people, 93% of all the food consumed in any day is, 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 is grown within the boundaries of Beijing. 
and Cape Town it's something like 15% of the food. Um, and and, uh, and uh, uh, the, the idea of the scales, of the, the different scales of um, uh, um, uh, urban agriculture, the, 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 the house yard, which can also be used to allow the house to grow, but can also be used for um, the, the family, then the allotment, which is a shared space, and intensively watered, and then the large commercial um, green space. Um, this now I'm moving to Cape Town, and this uh, Cape Town is a, a very different um, uh, climate from Johannesburg. The work I've shown you previously is a hot, dry climate with uh, diurnal variation um, and very dry, um, cold winter nights, but lovely sunny winter days. Cape Town is a Mediterranean climate. It's a very stormy climate with very strong winds and very wind, uh, very wet winters. So the system of construction changes. These are a series of daycare centres that we developed for the city of Cape Town. A basic, um, a, a basic set of three classrooms with a particular kind of um, set of ablution spaces behind, but which was developed as a as a as a, um, a, a, a constant program, but which was then adjusted to suit different sites. So this is one site that becomes another site. Um, the um, much of the work that we've been doing, I think now, and I'm, I'm bringing us up to date now, has been c concerned with, uh, let me rephrase that. Before 1994, much of the work that we did was in the NGO sector, um, which was funded externally um, and which uh, worked independently, as it would be the NGO non-governmental um, organizations, independently of any form of state control, because the state was run by the apartheid government. When the ANC came to power in 1994, they shut down the NGO sector in South Africa. And I think that was probably one of the cruelest things they could do because prior to 1994, the NGO sector, which was run by the United Democratic Front and the trade unions in South Africa, for every $100 that came into the country, $85 would find their way to people on the ground. Since the ANC has come to power and they've shut off the NGO sector, something like 40 40% or $40 gets to people on the ground and $60 get cons gets consumed and making its way there through inflated civil servants' um, salaries, through nepotism, through corruption, or whatever it might be. So it's an incredibly inefficient system. But the nature of our work has therefore had to change. So we now rely upon government work rather than NGO work for, what we, what, for, for, what, 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 for the kind of work we like to do. So the next set of projects I'll be showing you are a series of um, schools that we've recently completed, again in um, areas uh, in our cities that need development. And uh, the first school is, is uh, the school in, in Kailicha. Kailicha is a high-dense um, sort of mixed formal housing and informal shack de developments on the outskirts of Cape Town and the Cape Flats. The apartheid city is a difficult city because what you find in your cities, for example, is that the urban poor live close to the city centre and the rich live on the periphery. In South Africa, that process is reversed. The poor live on the periphery and the rich also live on the periphery, but some of the rich live in the city, in cities like Cape Town, which puts the poor in a real double bind because they have to travel huge distances to work or to find work every day. And it's a very costly and very um, unresourceful and unsustainable form of city development. <coughs> but this is a school that we built about five years ago in Kailicha um, for the state. Now, these school models that you see over here are apartheid school models. And they are built from a standard um, uh, kit of parts where there's no concern whatsoever for uh, the idea of fitting the building onto the site. The classrooms all have to face north-south, and that's the only dictate, and they're laid out in rows. The result of it is, is that you get um, buildings that don't in any way acknowledge the kind of urban form of what surrounds them, but more importantly, the uh, hugely inefficient use of space, and they become dangerous places as well. So we, we, we changed that entirely. In this school over here, for example, we built a tight up against the street. We took all the specialist classrooms, and we converted them into classrooms that could also open out onto the street to permit trading. So kids could, you know, domestic science, they could bake cakes, parents could bake cakes, they could sell it on Saturdays. Um, and, 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 and we then created a public route through the school, which would have to be carefully controlled. 
this, the sports field hasn't been built yet, but that would be a large um, a soccer field that's still to be constructed. We don't have the funding for it. But you can see a very, very different approach to the design of a school. I think these are highly inefficient. We'd like to think ours was, is, is an efficient response to it. That is one of the wonderful things about the state, I must say, in South Africa. I mean, I was very really, um, angry. I'm very angry with the way in which they shut down the NGO sector. But for architects, South Africa is a population of 35 million, uh, 45 million. We have 3,500 registered architects, which is a small number. Um, and the state uh, provides something like 80% of all the work for architects um, through um, uh, the commissioning of schools, hospitals, clinics, housing, etc. And the system of uh, appointing architects is not done on a competitive basis like you have in the United States or a fee basis. So you're appointed on a roster system, you pay paid full fees, a full recommended fee scale, so you have enough money to do a proper job. Um, and that, that, I think, is, is a real boon to architects in South Africa at the present time. Um, the Usasazo School I've just shown you over here, which you can see tries to make an urban edge to the site uh, with one single controlled entry point. Um, the next school is a school we've just recently completed in Danoon, and uh, it's, it's, it, uh, um, there's a young, not so young man here called Iwan Ba, who I finally just give him a plug, is one of the best architectural photographers that I know, who flew out to South Africa at no cost to us and photographed most of our buildings. And many of the photographs you see here tonight are from Uwa. If you want, thank you. Um, the, um, uh, this, this is a very, very interesting settlement because it's also on the outskirts of Cape Town, but about 50% of the people who live in this settlement um, are foreigners. Um, we, 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 we uh, in South Africa, have this, we have a, a, a very strange re a relationship with foreigners. We've probably read in the press over the last couple of years about the xenophobic attacks that happened in South Africa. We have a lot of Africans who come to South Africa illegally. They settle in South Africa. They're very well-educated people. I mean, we have people selling newspapers on street corners in Cape Town who've got degrees in economics from the University of Kinshasa and the DRC. Um, and they um, take away, I suppose, because of their entrepreneurial skills that have been developed over many years, which South African black people were denied because of apartheid and also because of a superior education that many of them had. And that causes huge tensions in those communities. And South Africans, where we have 35% unemployment in our country, people tend to take them out on the foreigners because they see the foreigners as stealing jobs. But where um, you do have large um, uh, uh, foreign uh, co concentrations of foreigners living in, in the shack settlement, you get an extraordinary urban conviviality emerging, which you don't find in many other um, settlements. And that certainly characterizes um, Danube. But uh, what, what was interesting about the Danoon School is that the first school that I showed you, which if I go back, um, tried to do all the right moves. It tried to make an edge to the streets. It tried to create a public route through the school. It tried to convert classrooms into public uses on weekends and create a public space behind. None of that worked. The school teachers and the headmaster were so overwhelmed with work, they were unable to cope with it. And the consequence of it is that um, uh, um, uh, criminal activity and gang activity in the school is very high. So the, 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 the next school we did, uh, learning from that literary experience, is one point of entry. You enter into a courtyard, and from there, you can't leave. So it's, a very, it's, a, it's, it's not like a panopticon, but uh, it <laughs> nonetheless um, uh, uh, works on a similar kind of basis, and that's the reality of what we have to deal with in our country. And it's an absolutely successful school. They have, in the Western Cape, I think last year, which was the first year of matric, they had one of the highest matric rate, pass rates of all the schools in the Cape Flats. Um, but it's a school that sits on a hill, and it again, like the churches that we made, tries to make some kind of urban, um, uh, 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 kind of urban uh, presence in what would be otherwise a fairly undifferentiated single story um, shack scale. So you can actually see that the, um, this is the kind of uh, character of the shack settlement and this is the form of the building text. That's the big hall, the library and the classrooms run around the side. I could talk to you about you know, the usual architectural speak that we've surrounded in the Western Cape with beautiful mountains, and this building seeks to mimic, mimic the kind of blah, blah, blah of the mountains. But the, the fact is that it's really an attempt to sort of give some kind of form 
to the school, where the school can then form at least a visual uh, center for this community. And it seems to have done that, I think, very well. And the courtyard on the inside, which um, is extraordinarily well used, and the main hall. But I wanted to also show you that the, the work that we do, and I, I think that I say this because um, I, I'm just keeping an eye on time, if you don't mind, um, that, that the work that we do is, whilst it's concerned with people, it's concerned with all kinds of people. We don't limit our work to poor people only. We work um, in, in all kinds of communities, but we have two rules in our office, and that is that when we get interviewed for jobs, we tell our clients that we're interviewing them as well, which reserves for us the right to accept or not. Well, we have three. The second one is that we won't work for anyone who simply chooses to use our work for profit, for them to use our work to make profit and nothing else. And the third one is that we do quite a few houses, but we won't build a house of more than 180 square meters, 1,800 square foot, because we think no one in this world deserves or should have the right to live in anything bigger than that. Now, that's very contentious, but we think we've got a little bit of land in this world. It's getting gobbled up because of rapid population increase, and we think that it's... We want to have maximum standards, not minimum standards, that you can't live in a piece of ground that's more than a certain size, and you can't live in a house that's bigger than a certain size. But I don't think we're ever going to see that legislated. But um, we we worked, for example, we're doing work at the present moment for a, a, an absolutely wonderful progressive school in Cape Town, and um, this gives you a sense of how beautiful that Cape landscape really is. This is in the city bowl of Cape Town, and um, uh, behind it you can see Table Mountain with the cable car station at the bottom, um, and this school is a um, multi-racial school, it's always been a church school, um, supported by the Anglican Church for the last hundred years or so, and we're busy rebuilding parts of the school. This is a gigantic big hall that we're busy starting work on now, which um, learns lessons from Eliade Dieste's work in Uruguay. Um, uh, I think he's an absolutely extraordinary engineer, and um, we've managed to somehow convince um, a, a very brave engineer in Cape Town to build a brick vault that's 25 meters in this direction and is probably only six inches thick. And if it collapses, we won't be sued, he will be. <laughs> um, but but the, the, the work that we do there, and, and again, you know, it, it's to try and show the range of work and nothing more than that. The series of interventions that um, we've, we've made in creating a, a new library out of an old gym filling in a courtyard with a series of learning hubs, as we call them, and building a circular um, uh, double-story um, uh, computer center. Um, and I think that what these buildings now start to learn about, and it's something that I think we're really starting to fold into our work, is this idea of, others, of, of slack space, of, of making spaces and buildings that, are, no, that are, are not so socially or functionally programmed that they can only be used for that purpose and nothing else. And it sounds a very easy proposition, but it's in fact very difficult. And sort of, I think we're on the right way when th this is, for example, the part, part of the library where we have uh, covered in the uh, courtyard and we built these teaching hubs, which are really nothing other than gigantic big timber circular pieces, which have got no purpose attached to them at all, other than that they can support groups of no more than 12 students. Um, and and it, this is the um, uh, computer center, which is, built out of um, uh, mosaic, glass mosaics, but these are those uh, spaces that I was talking to you about. And um, it's been an experiment and been a really quite wonderful experiment. I, I'm, I'm sure you know the genesis of these ideas. I'm, I love the work of Elder van Eyck and certainly um, his early work um, with the children's playgrounds and the orphanage. And these spaces, I think, build on many of those ideas. Um, but, uh, you know, there's a, a senior girl, um, and then there are these tiny little kids, and they occupy these spaces of their own free will, um, and they negotiate the use. If one group is using one of the spaces and another group wants to use it, they negotiate when that first group will end, and they can then move in. It's an absolutely extraordinary system, and it's outside of any form of teacher or adult control or supervision. Um, other, other kinds of buildings that um, we're involved in have to do with, um, we, we seem to get a lot of work from people that we work for who then ask us to do further work. 
and it's just really a question of being quite relaxed about how you add on to buildings and how you can take a house like this, for example, which started off as a simple U that then got added a little study and now has had a whole um, um, uh, of, a, of, a, of a, um, a, um, a guest cottage added on to it. Um, and, and I suppose we, 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 we're concerned about the way our buildings look, but we don't want to become so concerned about it that we're incapable of being able to have a bit of fun. Maybe that's the best way of describing it. So this, what, what is quite a sort of simple little, sh almost fisherman shack kind of building over here, which has all sorts of references to Scandinavian architecture, suddenly grows a little bit of Italian rationalism that's completely irrational. And we're quite happy with it. Beach houses that we do, this is a project that's on hold but will get built soon. Um, and we work as, I, I think it's because of our attitude towards um, what kind of clients we want to work for and what kind of um, size their building should be that we land up with exceptional buildings, uh, exceptional clients. Um, this is for a man, uh, Nicholas de Klerk, who has one of the world's most comprehensive, privately owned collection of Coca-Cola memorabilia in the whole world. Uh, Coca-Cola been trying to buy it for a number of years and um, he's refused. It's a 45 year old collection and he bought a tiny little um, uh, mining cottage in Johannesburg and asked me to convert it into a, uh, into a little bachelor's flat on the ground floor and then build a big um, museum space for himself on the top floor. And uh, this um, picture painting of St. Jerome in his study is something that's always fascinated me, the idea of a bigger space and then a series of spaces that are made by furniture. And that really became something that we carried through in this building. So he lives down here in a sort of set of spaces that are not dissimilar to St. Jerome's spaces. The bedroom is, consists of a series of timber pieces that can be moved around. The kitchen has a series of movable arms. And then on the top floor is the Coca-Cola Museum. And it's painted in the colors of Coca-Cola. Um, and it almost looks like a Coca-Cola um, uh, uh, can at the back. Um, and we're busy completing that house now. House for Twins, um, which then becomes uh, a double house with a shared common space. Um, and the, this image just really shows you the kind of absolutely wonderful landscape that one can work with in, in Cape Town. Um, and I was in Rome and I looked at the work of Borromini, and this has got nothing to do with Baroque architecture, but I just love the soft forms. And so it became a house of soft forms. Um, I'm going to go through these now. A very wonderful house that we're doing at the moment for a great couple, um, which is on a nature reserve opening out onto the sea in Cape Town, near Cape Point, um, which uh, has two flanking walls and um, makes an internal uh, world of itself. And if we're looking at this house at, at ways and means of being able to open it up as much as possible. We're going to finally end on um, uh, uh, red location, uh, which is uh, what Andres was speaking to you about and I think has really occupied us for a large part of our life, uh, of, of the last 10 years of our um, practice. Uh, red location is uh, a very interesting place. It's in uh, a place called New Brighton and Port Elizabeth. And it really comprises this area over here. And it's very interesting because these rusted buildings that you see over here originally came from a Boer concentration camp uh, in Newton Hague and were then moved after the Boer War to Red Location where um, uh, uh, black people, settled black families moved. I, what, I, I'm sure most of you know about the Boer concentration, uh, the Boer War, but just to let you know that it wasn't the Germans who discovered and invented concentration camps, it was the British. They put together concentration camps for Boer women and children, as well as black women and children in the Boer War. A good 40,000 Boer women and children died in the camps, and 50 to 60,000 black women and children died in the camps. And that was a small war. They died in inhuman conditions, the British staff, the kids and the women, and they, had, uh, they were disease ridden, and they did nothing at all to try and control the diseases. So they were essentially killing camps. Um, and what becomes interesting about this settlement here is that the Afrikaner women and children 
and black women and children that were incarcerated by the Boers, those self-same spaces were brought to New Brighton, were then settled by black families, and this settlement over here became a hotbed of um, a protest against the apartheid government. And some of our leaders, like Gavin Mbeki, the father of our ex-president, Thabo Mbeki, was born here, Raymond Mshlapa, George Pember, and others. So you have the same spaces occupying very, very different people, fighting, though, all, all of them fighting for their freedom. Um, this is an image of the uh, uh, Boer concentration camp, um, and this is what it looks like today. Um, this is where we built our museum. These are corrugated iron buildings, which are now national monuments, some of them. They're over 100 years old. And a very interesting problem, I'm working with a friend in Cape Town, where we're now trying to preserve these buildings. And how do you preserve a building that's made out of 100-year-old corrugated sheeting? Well, you don't want to replace the corrugated sheeting. Um, it's leaking, and you want to keep it in that condition that, you, you know, that deteriorates every time the wind blows or the, it rains. It's very difficult. The inside of the space is extraordinary. I mean, that's what it looks like from the outside. And then this wonderful dignity of people who make the most extraordinary, wonderful spaces for themselves out of the most unbelievably difficult circumstances. And the, the buildings as they are today. Um, the, the, there were two things that shaped what we did um, in the, for relocation. The first one was in after 1994, which, although we had a negotiated settlement, it was a revolutionary moment. But it became a time for us to think about everything, about culture, about architecture, about life. One of the issues that was raised was, what constituted a public building? How, did you make, how would you make a public building for the new South Africa? And it seemed to me, and it seemed to many other architects, that you didn't make it like you would have made it previously. Um, under the apartheid government, or under the colonial government. And um, one of the things that I looked at, and, and when I was a student, and when I was also teaching at Fitz University in the 80s, I was part of a team of people who used to design posters for the trade unions. And it was interesting because this is an example of one of, one of our trade union posters, is that um, in, in all the trade union, in, in most of the um, posters that were put up, there are always three building types that are represented. The double-storied school, the single-storied government house, and then the south-lit um, factory building. And on f looking at this matter with further research, what became very uh, exciting for me was that, and I, I think you know, for Americans, this is just me talking about my country, the struggle for um, freedom in South Africa was won by South Africans fighting within South Africa. The ANC in exile did a lot to help it, but if it hadn't been for the trade unions and the United Democratic Front, we would have never, ever had freedom in South Africa. Um, when the exiles came back to South Africa, they, they, they lauded it over the rest of us South Africans, but it's now starting to bite them because they don't know how to govern, and many of them are very corrupt. Um, but uh, what was very interesting about the research we did was that the factory was seen by many black South Africans as a place of struggle where the battle for freedom was fought and won. And the factory was not seen as a place where people sold their labor, but was rather seen as a place of civic virtue where the battle for freedom was, as I said before, won. And that led us to a very simple proposition. We said, fine, well, if we're going to look for a building for, let's start off in Port Elizabeth, an industrial city, uh, center of the motor car industry and so on, full of lots and lots of factories with, you know, sawtooth uh, roofs, let's use that typology. And so we developed that typology as, as the beginnings for trying to make a, public, a set of public buildings in South Africa. My sense is that it was successful. I mean, it can't stay there. It's got, to, it's got to move forward. But as a starting point, it was a good one because everyone has been happy with the building form. There's not been any kind of question. The, the only time we had anyone who misunderstood what we were doing. It came from a very old woman when, just as we were about to complete the, um, the uh, 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 museum, she walked into it and, and she asked where the swimming pool was. But I'll get back to that later. Um, the, the next image has to do with how to represent, if you're looking at making a museum, for example, how to represent a museum 
in a community of people in South Africa where they'd never had the opportunity to go to museums before. They didn't know what museums were. And the way of remembering um, of, of the way of remembering the past was 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 a verbal um, tradition. It was it was about passing it through stories. And um, when I lived in Johannesburg, uh, one of the most wonderful, remarkable things that I remember about the city were these markets in Johannesburg, where memory boxes. These are memory boxes found in my my um, factory, which you'll see are really kind of quite interesting. The iconography is. Quite interesting, you get Christian iconography, you get pagan and animist uh, uh, iconography, and all kinds of things. Now you get rap um, um, iconography as well. But these boxes are called memory boxes, and they come from the days of the early 19th century, uh, the early 20th century, when the British government, in an attempt to bring black men to work on the mines, introduced a poll tax. To the rural areas. Now, all the people in the rural areas were subsistence farmers, and to pay the poll tax, they had to go to the city to earn money in order to pay the poll tax. So it created an instant workforce within the cities, uh, particularly the gold mining industry. And what the, 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 the tradition that emerged then was that, the, well, the employment practices that emerged there was that people would, um, men would come to the city and work for 11 months of the year and return to the rural areas for one month. So you had a, a kind of um, rural urban uh, backwards and forwards migration system, but the families, would, certainly in the early days, would remain in the rural areas. And what the men on the in the hostels on the mines did is they created these small, what they call memory boxes, which became these things that they kept treasured memories of their families in the rural areas that would remind them of where they'd come from. And this has grown now into a, a very powerful um, a sort of cultural um, idea of, of, of remembering. So we said, well, let's make a museum that is constituted like a series of memory boxes so that people would understand what it meant. It also fitted very comfortably within a lot of feelings that I had at the time, and I don't think they've changed now, about trying to confront the idea of history as meta-narrative, and rather to see history as a series of memories that are connected in different kinds of ways. Um, and, and that led to this idea of the memory box. One of the other things that we looked at was and I go back to the, um, uh, the uh, concentration camps of the British, was that at the end of the Boer War, a wonderful um, South African suffragette, um, uh, I've forgotten her name now, um, uh, wanted to erect a monument to um, symbolize the universal suffrage of women and children in conditions of war. The Afrikaner nationalists got hold of it, and um, they converted it into the Afrikaans of Frau monument, which became a hugely potent symbol for Afrikaner nationalism in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. And the Afrikaans of Frau monument became so powerful that it leached out all references to the suffering and deaths of black women and children in the concentration camps. So what we were saying to the ANC is, don't try and write a meta-narrative or meta-history of the struggle for freedom in South Africa, because you're going to do the same thing that the Afrikaner nationalists did. You're going to exclude too much, and you're going to lie. And amazingly, the ANC in the Eastern Cape bought that. So what we've done is the memory boxes are, 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 um, are, are um, grouped around ideas, themes of, of suffering, of struggle, I'm sorry. Um, but they have to do with things like men and uh, children and uh, children and suffering, the underground, women, a whole range of issues, black women, white women. Uh, and and we've, we've opened up. Um, the kind of understanding of what constituted struggle for different groups of people through our troubled history. So the um, original uh, competition project uh, comprised three or four buildings, of which the museum was one. And as you can see with the buildings, the um, idea of the south-lit roof light um, is a predominant typology. This is a school, museum, library, um, and an art gallery. But um, what, what we obviously did was adjust it to suit the particular program. Um, the, 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 the first building, which I'll be showing you tonight, is the museum, which Andre spoke about. And the museum really comprises a, um, a, an outdoor plaza, which um, is open to uh, the public. The building is open on all sides to the public, well, except on that side over there. And um, you can see that you have a grand internal foyer over here. The south roof light works in that direction like that. And then 12 boxes that are placed in a strict grid but where there's no indication given at all um, in, uh, on the boxes about what is in the content. You have to enter each box to discover for yourself what's contained in the box. 
And the sequence that you move through is entirely up to you. Um, and this, I think, becomes a very important drawing, um, which, which really talks about the idea of the memory box um, and the idea of the um, bigger uh, roof that sits around it. And at the time that um, I was working on this project, I was reading people like Andreas Hazen, and particularly I was interested in his idea of twilight memory, that idea of when you know, the past moves into the present. Uh, when, the past, when the present moves into the past, there's a kind of twilight period. So in a sense, this, this symbolic value of this is that this represents a past, um, and the outside of the body represents present reality, and this is a kind of in-between twilight space. And in fact, this in-between space is probably for me the most important space in the library, in, in the museum, because it's this, a space of meditation, it's a space of understanding, um, and it's a space that's entirely up to uh, each person to make it themselves. Okay, the, the museum itself, uh, this is, believe it or not, uh, it is, this has been recently proclaimed a national monument, this little building over here which is, I think, quite extraordinary on the part of our government. But how do you keep that in some kind of condition without rebuilding it? And we've still not figured it out. And the context um, for our museum. And again, uh, you know, bravo to our government, you know, this uh, kind of commitment to development and transformation. When you build a museum, what you do now is you, you build it where people live, and they live in shacks. And the, the shacks sit comfortably adjacent to the museum. And it changes entirely the reading of the city. And it certainly changes the reading of the city for people outside of South Africa. And this, uh, I think, uh, image captures for me um, very nicely um, the uh, character of that inside space, which is a sort of heavy grey space, I think, because we spent a lot of time uh, looking at what the quality of the light would be. This man over here was the foreman on the job, and um, he just sat there one day. A friend of mine, David Southwood, took this photograph, and I don't know, he was just sitting there thinking, my God, I did this. <laughs> I can't believe it. Um, but uh, the, uh, the um, so the, and, and what these big, gigantic, rusted, corrugated iron boxes seem to have, or seem to offer, is an understanding of, of um, uh, a, a, a different scale and order of things. People come here, it's, it's, it's got a kind of mimetic effect because people read these as gigantic city buildings, as shacks, as houses, as upturned casks, all kinds of things. And the internal, the in, inside, um, uh, uh, of one of the boxes. This is a, a wonderful man who was a trade unionist and who was one of the first people to be executed by the South African state in the 1960s. And these boxes here, are uh, they don't contain the real files, but each one of these boxes represents um, the, the name of a person who died in police custody accidentally, which was the favored way of the apartheid government of killing off people who opposed them. You'd be arrested, interrogated, and then you would have broken your neck by slipping on a bar of soap. Or you would have thrown yourself out of a first floor window. And that's how they killed people. And again, the unexpected in these buildings. Um, on the opening, uh, we had a series of choirs who came uh, from all over the Eastern Cape. The Eastern Cape is some of the best choir um, in the world. And they sang at the opening, and we discovered for some strange reason that these boxes created the most fantastic acoustic space. So now our museum is given over to regional choir competitions every now and then. So it's a museum, but it's also a space where people can come and perform. And I'm very happy about that. It's a very nice way of thinking about our museum and be made to work. Then we're now busy completing this, and as Andrew said, this is probably a project that will last for another 25 years, but we've completed the museum. We're now completing the library and the um, uh, gallery, and uh, we'll soon be starting on a school and two big theatres, and we're building 250 houses around it. So when we've finished with this project, 
we will have created an entirely new kind of South African city centre, which will be culturally based, where people live 24 hours a day, um, and it will have been built in probably the poorest part of the city. Very brave. The library um, is the first library of its kind in South Africa. It's an entirely di it's a, a digital library, and we now um, have built an archive building which will archive all the literature of struggle history in the Eastern Cape, as well as many, many important documents. The um, digital library space itself and the building under construction. The construction process that we have is that um, local people are employed in construction, that uh, the, we have a formal builder, a, a, a properly educated and trained builder who runs the project but he has to employ local people in construction. People are chosen by a lottery for work on the site and they, they work on the site in three monthly shifts. So after three months, a new range of workers are brought onto the site, which means the builder's job is an absolute nightmare because he has unskilled people coming onto the site they work on the site for only three months. As they start to develop skills, they're replaced by a new set of people. The decision to do this was entirely that of the local community because they wanted to spread the, spread the benefits of construction, of, of the construction work amongst as many people as possible, which is absolutely uh, um, uh, understandable. But when you see the quality of construction, I think it's absolutely amazing that the builder can do this using essentially 50% of local labor, unskilled local labor, on a three-month rotational basis. The archive building is, is, is clad in a very cheap form of South African um, uh, pine, which is a very soft, coarse-grained um, uh, softwood. And um, the uh, idea of it is, is that, that the building itself is built out of good, proper materials, concrete, concrete block. But it's faced with, in this case, for example, the archive building, which is probably the most important building, it's faced with a local material that's ubiquitous to the area that people use, build fences out of and build housing out of. And again, it's our attempt to try and elevate something that, is grow that, 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 that belongs, to, you know, has local use into something that is elevated in, in terms. And this absolutely extraordinary um, uh, uh, um, uh, quilting, if you want to call it that, no, there's another word for it, so I can't think of it. It's based on Guernica, and it's uh, nine meters long, like Guernica, about three and a half meters high, and it's made by local women uh, working under um, the guidance of a, a local artist. It took a hundred women six months to build, to make, and it's going to go into the foyer of our um, uh, library building. And uh, the women chose Guernica, and you can see the structure of the um, of, of, of the artwork is, is, is exactly the same as Picasso's Guernica, but rather than outrage at Franco's murderous um, uh, activities, this is um, a people's um, uh, anger at AIDS. So you can actually see that uh, the figures are women, and women are the people who suffer, the, the, the gender that seems to suffer most in South Africa in terms of, aid, of AIDS. And underneath here are a list of women from the local red location area each one of these little plaques. It's a little tin um, plaque with the name and a date of birth and date of death represents one a woman from that community who's died of AIDS over the last 10 years. So very moving and I think very, very beautiful artwork. Um, and then the, the gallery itself is a very straightforward building. Uh, everything is self-lit, uh, thermally efficient buildings. I can give you the whole story. Um, we don't look for LEED certification, but I can promise you, we don't have any air conditioning. We've, I've done 250 buildings in South Africa the last 25 years, and only one building has been air conditioned. They're entirely naturally lit, naturally cooled, and naturally warmed. Um, and the, the, uh, this is the art gallery and the new art school. So I'm almost finished. And the building under construction. And you can see over here how people use that self-same um, uh, uh, South African pine that we use to clad our archive building, how they use it for constructional purposes. And that gives an idea now of, of, of what is actually happening. The gallery, the museum is in the background, this is the art gallery, 
and the library is over here with the gigantic big cinema screen in that position. The school we built over here, and uh, the um, two new theatres we built over here. And this will become, I think, the only cultural centre that's kind anywhere in Africa. The um, art gallery itself has absolutely beautiful natural light, um, and uh, I, so you understand south is equivalent to your north in America. So it's not direct south. Um, and I'm very proud of that con concrete construction, again, done by local people. The next portion of housing that we're doing, um, I was interested in seeing the rural housing project in Andres's exhibition. It's a very cheap housing prototype that costs 20,000 US dollars, which in South African terms is the equivalent of 140,000 Rand. In South Africa, for 140,000 rand, we can build six houses. So it's, it's a different world. What you consider to be a low um, a, a minimum standard in the United States, for us in South Africa, is very high indeed. So um, each one of these little houses over here is a government, it's a, built out of a government subsidy. That would be one house, another house, shared common walls, but with the idea that you get around to the back where you can then build a shack and you can rent and make a bit of additional income. But each one of these houses over here cost the equivalent of about 6,000 US dollars. And we're building 250 of them. And it's a, it's a very compressed urban environment, and hopefully it will become a very congested environment as well. We have to make provision for cars, but the cars will be parked on the side of the street. There is no provision for the cars on the site, because a car would probably cost three times the price of one of these houses. So if people can't afford a house, they certainly are going to afford a car. But as you can see, we're proposing that people build buildings in the back of their yards because of the long, thin sites. And this is what everyone seems to do in these areas in South Africa to create additional income. They build houses and spaces in the backyard of the house, which they then rent out. So what is important is that from the street, you can get to the backyard without having to go through the house. And then finally, um, the, the um, two new um, uh, galleries, that we're, the two new theatres that we're doing, uh, which are in the process of uh, being approved by the city, and we'll start construction next year or two. To close up, really what I wanted to try and show you tonight, I hope I haven't gone on for too long, but um, I, I wanted to talk to you about, I wanted to try and show you a work that is quite different from, say, the work of the a world that is quite different from the world of the United States. But curiously enough for me, it shouldn't be different. Um, and it seems to me that the difference lies in uh, an attitude towards how does it you make architecture. And it seems to me that contemporary architecture, contemporary architects in wealthy parts of the world seem to focus entirely upon making buildings that are novel, that are different from what anyone has ever done before, um, and which cost huge amounts of money and consume huge amounts of energy, both in their construction, choice of materials, and in their running. It seems to me that people don't count too much any longer. That when architects design buildings nowadays, they never consult the people who use their buildings, the caretakers, the janitors, the office workers, the people who clean the toilets. It seems to me that we need to recover that and it seems to me, certainly, in my limited terms, and I'm not trying to pretend that this is anything more than a very limited attempt at trying to make something that's of purpose, is that it's in conditions of great scarcity, where people are very poor, that we seem to recover the sense of what architecture could be. Thank you very much.